Thanks for jumping on the podcast today, David. Yeah. Um, you bring a really unique background, you know, as a real estate investor, but also as an owner operator of a transaction coordinating company or national transaction coordinating company. And that's really what I want to dive into on today's podcast. I just want to touch on some of the real benefits that real estate investors can take away from uh, using the services that you provide. So I'll let you take it away. Yeah, well, you know, like you mentioned before we jumped on here, that cost seg was the least sexy thing to talk about. Well, transaction coordinating is, coordinating is pretty similar. I get asked to come in and speak on stage and I'm like 30 minutes to talk about transaction coordinating because the, sim the idea behind it is incredibly simple, right? Our job at Easy REI Closings is to give our clients their time back. That's it, right? The thing that we specialize in is the stuff that's really kind of obscure and the thing that nobody ever teaches you. As it is, most of us got started in this business by you know, watching a YouTube video or reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is fantastic, right? And you know, within that, you know, we got into real estate for a reason, right? Obviously to make money, but hopefully to help some people and, and do, do a little bit of good in the world. But you know, nowhere in any of those books or podcasts was, hey, let's learn what monument of title is. <laughs> hey, let's learn what to do when there's a really dirty title that, you know, is left in somebody's name who died 30 years ago. What do we do there? Isn't that exciting stuff? And so, you know, we're here to, to fill that gap between the investor and getting clear title, which sometimes can be a very short gap. Other days, it looks like the Grand Canyon. Because what, you know, what we do typically as investors, a lot of times is, you know, we go out and we look for people who have problems or properties that have, that have problems. And, you know, the, the more problems that we can solve, the lower we can, we can get our asset at. And, the lower and I price. think, I think what a lot of, you know, a lot of guys that are real estate investors may not recognize is that when you're looking at some of the larger residential or commercial yeah. teams out there, they're doing, you know, let's say hundreds of deals a year, and they've got teams of people that are working in the background yeah. to help them facilitate these transactions and take them to the closing table. Yeah. So a lot of times, uh, real estate investors that I'll work with on a day-to-day -day basis, they may do one or two deals a year, or maybe 10 deals a year. That mm -hmm. doesn't always justify them having the staff on hand to really be the advocate to drive them uh, through or through the closing. Yeah. And a lot of times they're relying on their knowledge or maybe, you know, a title company or an attorney's office yeah. to help guide them through the process. And I just feel that that is where, again, sometimes the least sexy thing in the world becomes <laughs> so critically important is because what the product that you offer, the service can take the investor that's doing I don't know, let's say one deal a year, two deals a year, 10 deals a year, and yeah. give them the confidence to go in and make offers in areas that might be out of their local market. Yeah, 100%. You know, so if you're working on a team and maybe that maybe your broker or whoever is running that team does have a TC for your transaction coordinator, fantastic, right? And the way that these people are growing their businesses and scaling them is by having somebody that you can outsource or hand off that paperwork to, it allows you to really focus on the parts of your business that move the needle, right? Which is talking to sellers and talking to buyers and, you know, getting those deals done not <clears throat> sitting around worrying, oh my goodness, who do I need to collect some paperwork from? What is it the, t the title company needs now? How are we gonna clear this ex exception off the title report? So yeah, 100%, I think you're right. It definitely, you know, when we've seen this time and time again where our clients have gone from doing one or two deals a month to three, four, five, not because we're doing the deal for them, but because we're giving them back 20 or 30% of their time that otherwise was spent doing emails, making phone calls, just, you know, it's kind of dealing with title companies can be, you know, it's like death of a thousand paper cuts because it's one question at a time and one email. And then the next day is the next question. And you're just having to constantly stop what you're doing. And I was saying before we jumped on the call too, in a previous life, I was a, a mortgage broker. So now I'm officially in a recovering mortgage broker. Love it. And I'll tell you that uh, whether it's a loan processor on the processing side mm -hmm. or a transaction coordinator on the real estate agent side, yeah. it is so important to have that person in your corner because not everybody plays nice on the other side of those contracts. Yeah. Some yeah. agents, some owners are looking for expiration dates, not intentionally to kick you out and have you lose the deal, but if they've got another offer that came in that's better sure. and yours happens to disappear because you forgot to 
initial on a piece of paper, that, right. that could be a gigantic problem. Mm -hmm. And can you maybe talk about a couple of um, scenarios yeah. that you've seen or that you've helped save yeah. deals where otherwise they just would have went to the wayside? Sure. Lots of times. And especially when you get some of these contracts that get to be 10, 15, 20, 25 pages long. And let's be honest, I've been doing this for 22 years and I hate reading those contracts because I feel like I'm always searching for that needle in the haystack, that one check mark that's going to have a, you know, a 20 or $30,000 swing one way or the other. Typically where we see a lot of problems are, you know, when people aren't using the state approved contracts, if they're using some other kind of contract that they've gotten from someplace, right? Because they're doing a, a, you know, a creative type deal. Yeah. And, you're a wholesaler. You're, you're yeah, wholesaling yeah, a deal. For sure. And, you know, when you get outside of the state approved contracts, which, you know, you can certainly use any contract, anything that two people sign is legal, but, you know, they've downloaded this contract from just somebody off the internet and they don't understand what the language inside, inside of it means. So instead of saying, you know, you must, or, you know, the seller or the buyer must do something by this point, it says they may do something. Well, may is not the same as must, right? So we, we do see that and we try to, as our clients come on board, bring their contracts in and go over them and make suggestions because after doing 3,000 closings over the last couple of years, you know, it's sort of like the matrix, right? We, we can just see those problems coming in very, very slow motion. So yeah, we, we catch stuff like, like that all the time, especially in you know, some of the more, more creative type deals. Absolutely. Now you're based out of uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about uh, what, you, what got you started in uh, just the real estate space. And also how did you, uh, let's say, stumble into the transaction coordinator world? Yeah, well, it's sort of it's sort of strange. So uh, my wife and I started investing. We bought our first house back in 2002 when we got married <clears throat> and we were in Central Florida. We were actually in Apopka, Florida, just north of Orlando. And both of us had full time jobs back then. I worked for, you know, like 84 lumber. There were some lumber companies, you know, lumber distributors. And my wife worked as a purchasing agent for a, uh, a custom builder. So we had full time jobs and we were sort of those like weekend rehabbers. You know, we would buy our houses and work, work on them on nights and weekends. And we did that pretty successfully for uh, about seven years until 2009 happened, which was kind of the end of the world for, for real estate investors. <clears throat> and we bought our last house in uh, Deltona, Florida. Bought it, it was a little probate deal, bought it for 97,000. An identical house had just sold like two months before for 214,000. And this house was literally one block over, two blocks down. We bought ours, closed in, I think July. So back then I was younger and skinnier and had more energy. And we did all of the, uh, all of the rehab ourselves. So I finished in November, early November. And I called my realtor and she said, Hey, yeah, just, um, like, let's put it on the market in, in January. So, you know, you don't want a bunch of days on market in, in the, uh, you know, between the holidays. So I said, fantastic. So the short version is she came in in January and said, you did a great job. And I'm like, thanks. I know. Of course, of course it was a great job. I said, what can we get for it? And she's like, well, maybe 147. And I said, no, 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 no. One block over two blocks down, 214. She's like, yeah, that was six months ago. So wow. that was how fast the market dropped for, for anybody that wasn't around back then. <clears throat> so it's always entertaining now when I see people on social media talking about the crash that we're in. We are in a minor adjustment. You know, we lost in Florida, what, 40% in six, seven months. I mean, it was it yeah, was you guys got crushed in Florida. It was off, for sure. it was off the charts. So, anyways, so we we muddled through. We got that property sold, but we knew we were looking for a better spot. So we we searched around the country and we stumbled upon Chattanooga, who you know is a, an emerging market. The um, home values had only dropped about ten percent here, which was very light. Let's see, Volkswagen had just announced that they were opening their first production facility in the United States here. Uh, Amazon was opening two fulfillment centers had a population of about 275,000 and it was slated to grow 20%, which is a big, that's a big number, right? So we decided to take a chance on Chattanooga. We moved here and uh, we started out, we had literally no money. I tell people, if this is the line for broke, we were, we were half of that. We didn't even have <laughs> money to be considered broke. We <laughs> moved here with my wife, my two boys, three fat dogs and my brother. And between us, we had $5,000. We had to go do something because we didn't have jobs. So we started wholesaling real estate. And we did that for a couple of years. And I'll tell you, you know, Brian, when, when you have no other funds coming in and you have a wife, two boys and three fat dogs, you figure stuff out pretty darn fast. So uh, we, we did that. We, I think we did over 40 deals our first year, which was, wow. which was pretty good. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So we hustling. were, yeah, we were hustling. We were relatively successful. We were, we were the only people wholesaling in this market. 
So when that was, was this? Was it, you were 2000, talking about 2009. Yeah, so, June 09. Oh, wow. So this is not like yesterday. No. This is, no. This is a long time ago. So this is uh, before anybody knew what wholesaling was. Certainly you were, no you were literally was. writing the book on it. Yeah, definitely here. Definitely here. When we were when we would go to title companies and say, hey, I have this assignment of contract, they'd be like, son, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so, you know, we had, to, we had to be a little bit creative with how we did it. Certainly buyers didn't understand any of that. So, you know, we sort of made it look like a purchase and a sale, but really the paperwork, we were able to mesh them together to make it, to make it an assignment. Yeah, we did that for a couple of years. We really focused on, you know, lower price properties because back then, you know, you couldn't wholesale to a rehabber. Why? Because nobody was getting loans. There was no, you could, who were you going to sell the house to if you rehabbed? So nobody was rehabbing. And we certainly weren't doing the Burr method or anything like that because nobody could get loans, right? Banks were still busy taking properties back. So we really found our niche selling to landlords. You know, so we were in the, the lower end part of town. We were contracting properties at, you know, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000, selling them at, you know, 17, 18, maybe 25. Like that was a, that was a high price property for us back then. And we just did that over and over and over again until the market started to shift. And along the way, we had some opportunities to start picking up properties with seller financing. So it looked different from sub two. It's not any of that. You know, I was making offers. Interesting. I was running around and I was making offers to people on their properties. And Ryan, sometimes let's just use an example. You know, seller wanted $80,000 and we would offer 60, right? Because that's, that's what we could, we could afford to contract it at and then sell it to a cash buyer. But, but they owed 90, right? So essentially they were underwater. So after doing this time and time again, you know, I was making offers to people and they just literally could not accept that offer, right? I get it. You could do a short sale, but that's not the business we were in. So I remembered because I had spent a lot of time going to local real estate groups and RIAs and meetups, all that stuff. The percentage of properties in the United States that are owned free and clear. Do you, do you have any idea what that percent is? Uh, my guess would be somewhere like 60%. Again, Are guess. 40%. 40%. 40% right. of, of properties, according to First American, are actually owned free and clear. So I thought, well, like, let me just market to those people. They may not like my offer, but at least they could accept it, right? So I started doing all of my marketing to people who did not have a mortgage on their property. And with those people, I could offer them, you know, 60 if they wanted 80. And even if they said no, well, then I could back up and go, well, let me ask you a question. Do you need all the money at once? So what that, that, that did is that opened the door to do a lot of seller financing where the seller would carry the note. So we bought over 100 properties that way, probably from 2010, 11, up until maybe 2014 when the market really turned around. And you know we had over 100 properties in our portfolio, portfolio at one time, just millions of dollars worth of properties that all over time have just quadrupled in value. Wow. So it's really just identifying the market that you're going to go after yeah. and then going after it. Yeah. So There's what a finding, cool story, you know, yeah, to, finding to, that to, to literally wow. make lemonade out of lemonade, lemons here because we're talking about 2009. Yeah. Um, and like you said, anybody that was in the real estate market back mm -hmm. then had seen, and I think I saw in your bio that you got started back in 2002. Mm -hmm. So it was gangbusters up yeah. until about 2007. Mm -hmm. And then things when it, it hit, it hit really hard. It, so it was crazy, you know, because I was in the building materials business, I was selling doors and trim windows, garage doors to people like, you know, Pulte Holmes, Lennar, like the big track builders and all the salesmen, because we were all dealing with, with these large, large companies, like you, you saw a slowdown was coming, but you couldn't tell how quickly or how fast it was coming at you until it just stopped. And when yeah. it, stopped, it just stopped, it was the, uh, someone shut off the spigot yeah. and then from, from doing the, the real estate deals, mm -hmm. how did you, how did you transition into opening a, a national and we are talking about a national yeah. transaction coordinator business, yeah. because this is a, a such a, a key thing too, mm -hmm. is when you're looking to work with a, a transaction coordinator, yeah. you want that person to literally be your best friend, yeah. the person that you call in the morning on the way to work to see what's going on. And then how did you make that, that adjustment of the yeah, transition? So, you know, we sort of fell into it a little bit backwards. So we <laughs> just, be, we were running a nationwide wholesaling company. So we were wholesaling anywhere from 30 to 40 deals per month. So we were, we were pretty big. We were, we were doing a lot. We had a big staff <clears throat> and we out, were outgrowing our current offices. So we moved to the location we're at now. 
So here we're, we have 6,000 square foot. It's really like three main offices. So we had this extra office and uh, this is right as COVID is starting, we're signing this lease. So Brian, we're like, hey, we have this office. We're gonna make it like a WeWork office or a shared office space. Because guess what everybody wanted during COVID? Shared office space, right? So Absolutely. <laughs> I spent like $10,000. I have all this furniture and built them out a kitchen, all this stuff. And, uh, you know, no, 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 we work, no, no shared office space. So about a year later, you know, it's basically still sitting empty. COVID hits. I got rid of the partner that I had. It was just me. And we're still, we're still wholesaling like crazy. And, uh, you know, some friends of mine that run big businesses, big you know, big wholesaling businesses that said, Hey, during COVID, I, you know, I let some of my, let some of my people go. Our business is booming, you know, business bounced back. Can you help us do, do some TC stuff? Cause I really specialized in helping, you know, selling deals and, you know, sales and marketing and in the transaction side. So I said, sure, I've got some coordinators. We can, we can, we can just help you short term. And that started. And then we added a couple more people and then a couple more friends of ours that ran some big businesses. I'm like, well, you know what? I, there's really nobody that does this at scale for, you know, for real estate investors, for sure. There are no real companies that do this at scale for agents either. You there's know, not that, anybody at scale for agents. No. And I'll tell you the, the thing is, is when you're, you know, you're a real estate agent, if you have a transaction coordinator that you're working with, you are absolutely not going to share that person's right. name with right. anybody else, because yeah. the last thing that you would want to have happen is, they go to work for them and they no longer have time to take on your deals. No, you're exactly, it's like your, like your best contractor. You're never, never, ever going to share that. So I was at a, uh, I was at a mastermind down in Cancun, someplace down in there <clears throat> with some of the biggest investors in the country. And I said, you know what, guys, I'm thinking about opening this transaction coordination company. And one of my best friends, he's like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. That's the worst part of the business. That is literal brain damage. I'm like, yeah. I think we can do it. I think that we can do it. And that was three and a half, maybe almost four years ago now. And I said, yeah, I think we're going to do it. We're going to try it. I think there's a need for it in the marketplace. I don't think people, there's nobody that teaches you how to do it because transaction coordinating is more than just a checklist, right? It's actually looking at, you know, at the type of deal, you know, the deal where it's at, what the situation is, and then figuring out how to solve all those problems, right? Because to get to closing, what do we have to have? Clear title. So yeah, we, we started about three years ago and it grew the first year, it grew a little bit more the second year. Last year, we 4X the company and we expect to 4X again. And uh, we just cro crossed 200 and $214 million in closings for our investors. That's awesome. Yeah. And you know, it's really unique too, because you're not just working or you're not working in the residential space per se. Yeah. You're working with wholesalers and yeah. investors yeah. across the United States. And I've never heard of anybody doing that yeah. as a TC. So it's what a great idea. And I think you hit it on a second ago. Nobody teaches you how to be a transaction no. coordinator. The other thing they don't teach you is how to close a deal and have everybody be happy at the end of the day right. so right. you can go do another deal. Mm -hmm. And I'll just tell you, that's another, just such a, a important piece because when you're inviting an employee or a contractor mm -hmm. into your, your deal that you're putting together, you mm -hmm. know, these things are like, uh, you know, it's like a Fabergé, a Fabergé, Fabergé egg. Fabergé egg. Yeah. Sorry, I can't even pronounce it. It's like an eggshell. And what yeah. you don't want to do is you don't have someone drop it. That's exactly the metaphor that I use all the time. You know, we treat your deal like a Fabergé egg. We hold it in our white Thank gloves you. and we're going to carry it across the finish line. And, you know, you mentioned earlier talking about title companies and attorneys. You know, I think back to when I was just starting in, in wholesaling here in Chattanooga and I would take, you know, I would take my contract in, I would be very excited and I'd be like, Hey, you know, I've got this, this new deal. And the attorney would be like, Oh, David, that's got dead people. You're going to have to go through probate. I'm like, really? You know, back, you know, maybe it was a eight or $10,000 assignment fee. You know, I'd go in and they'd be like, Oh, you know, this one, this one, you know, has some problems. You need to do a super quiet title. And it was over and over and over again. I was getting these, I don't even know if they were objections. I just really felt like I was getting blown off. Why? Because you know, first off, some of these deals are a little complicated and they're not the favorite for title companies. And, you know, a title company or an attorney, they, they, I feel like they're bred to just give you the hardest answer possible, right? Like it's, you know, yeah, we're, cause, you know, they want you to get an attorney. They want you to go through the court system. They want you to, to do things. And I remember one day, Brian, I took this, this file in 
And uh, this, the same attorney, we started calling him Dr. No, because literally everything was no, right? He was like the evil guy from James Bond. So I'm like, Jeremy, I got this deal. Um, he's like, you know, same thing, probate. I'm like, dude, come on. I told this lady we could, we could, we could, we could get this closed. Like I literally just left her house. I'm like, what would you do? There's got to be something we could do, which was the question. Well, yeah, I guess if you can get me a death certificate and this other thing and these two things and, you know, two affidavits, we could close it. I'm like, bro, are you telling me? all these deals that I've been throwing away, there was actually a way that we could get those over the finish line. Yeah. Well, maybe not all of them. I'm like, dude, right. Eight to $10,000 a pop. Yeah. It was a significant it, number after it's two worth a little bit of brain power. Yeah. So, so that's when I realized, you know, you have to ask good questions and you have to understand how to ask the right questions. You have to, you have to push people a little bit and make sure that, you know, you're working with, you know, a title agent or an attorney or escrow officer that, you know, wants to see you get these deals closed, right? And I'm not saying we're not, I'm not bending the rules. We're not doing anything illegal, right? But there's, there's oftentimes another route that you can take without, you know, going through, you know, super quiet title or bankruptcy or probate or whatever it is, right? In order to satisfy the underwriter to get, to get a clear title. Now, one of the things that uh, I was reading on your website is, you know, I think you'd mentioned it's turning um, transaction coordinating into a profit center. Yep. For your yeah. business, and yeah. could you could you tell me a little bit about that? I think that's kind of an interesting approach as well. Yeah. So again, I, I was at another mastermind, and you know, I encourage people, you know, to go to masterminds and events, and you know, boot camps, all of those things, because the, the education that you'll get there is is amazing. Not only that, the conversations that you have in the hallways are really, you know, can change your business. So, anyways, <clears throat> I'm at this this mastermind, and this one kid stands up from Dallas, Texas, and he was talking about putting in an administrative fee into his, into his selling contract. And he was talking about two, 295 admin fee and it helped him offset some of his payroll. So I said, huh? So I remember I was sitting on the plane going back and I'm like, well, if Donnie can do 295. I could do 595. I'm like, right. Why not? So my thinking was, oh, if I put, if I put 595 administrative fee into my, you know, selling contract. So my end buyer pays it you know, and I'm doing 10 of these a month. Well, now I can offset my transaction coordinator. When we opened this company, that was one of the things that we taught our clients to do. Yeah, you're going to pay us. No question. We're going to get paid just like, you know, every, nobody works for free, but we're going to do it at an incredibly high level. And I'm going to show you how you can pass that charge on to your, to your end buyer so that you can actually, you know, for us, if you're doing five deals a month, it works out to maybe $400 a transaction. But I have clients that are charging their environment 950. Yeah. So that it's is a profit very, center. Very, and very and it's a hell of a deal for your clients. You know, yeah, your, your fee is absorbed basically through this. So what a great, yeah, what a great and, idea. An agent or an investor, you're juggling a million things, right? You're you're con we're all entrepreneurs. I get it. So if we can take take this business and put it over here, we, you know, we have 18 coordinators here in our office. This is all that they do every day. I promise you, we will handle your deal better than you could ever handle it. Plus, when our team gets on the phone with your buyers and sellers and brokers and, and mortgage brokers and title companies, you know, it's, it's a very high level of professionalism that now you're able to go and spend your time on, on the things that matter. And, you know, by outsourcing it to us, you're just, it's just an extension of your team. And you're, you're just really, you know, you're going to look like you really know what you're doing. And I think that that's so cool is just having an extension of your team. You yeah. know, it's bringing on employees can be difficult at the very best. Sure. So if you, um, if you can have a contractor that is, you know, paid per deal mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry about everything else that goes along with a specific employee, you know, then outsourcing it, I think is, it's just such a great idea. So, yeah. yeah. I generally have two rules that I've learned after doing this for 20 years that talk about outsourcing. The first rule is if you're going to outsource, can that person do it better than you, right? So that's your first, the first hurdle, right? You have to look at that. In our case, I promise you, we can do it better after doing thousands of files. You know, just the institutional knowledge in our four, four walls here is going to be far greater than anything that you've got or that you can hire. And can we do it cheaper, right? Can we do it cheaper than you can do it yourself or that you can hire somebody? Yes, absolutely. Um, especially when we show you how to turn it into a profit center, like there's nothing that's going to be cheaper than that. So yeah, for sure, you know, I, I feel like this is one of the reasons that we've grown so quickly is we've sort of been able to put all the pieces together because 
I'm a real investor. You know, the people that work for me, you know, at least a lot of our management people are real investors who have done rehabs and wholesale deals and novations and sub two and creative and all of the different types of deals. So everybody on our team, all of our certified coordinators understand how to how to tran transact those deals and get them over the finish line. I love it because you've done it. You've seen uh, probably deals that most people will never see in their entire lives. Yeah. You've walked them to the finish line and oh. now you've got a team of guys that are there to support other real estate investors in mm -hmm. the in the market. Really so before us. we, uh, I was going to say, before we wrap up, what's the best way for someone to reach out and get in touch with you? Um, I'm easy to find on Instagram. So David Olds, REI, but then our website is EZ, the letter E, the letter Z, REI closings.com. Jump on there. You can right underneath the video, there's a little blue box and you can schedule a time to, to chat with me or somebody on our team. And, you know, if hiring a transaction coordinator would help you in your business, we'd love to just jump on a call and kind of talk about what you got going on and where you're looking to go and if we'd even be the right fit for you. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say too, is who's your ideal avatar? Who is your perfect client? For us, somebody that's really doing two to three deals per, per month and wants to grow, right? If you, if you want to grow, if, if you're just looking to do one deal a month, you can certainly, you can certainly do that, do that on your own. But if you're finding that you don't have enough time in your day, you're running around kind of like a chicken with your head cut off. Paperwork is not your strength, which let's be honest, it's not for most entrepreneurs. Then, you know, let's talk about handing that off to us and let us do all the paperwork so you can go out and, and focus on building your business and doing the stuff that moves the needle. Perfect. David, yeah. thank you for jumping on the podcast today. And I hope to talk to you really soon. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.